Hey friends, you might have found yourself recently in a situation where you were expected to create a live stream for your church or to get your assemblies or Bible classes online. And you're like, I didn't train for this. This isn't what I went to graduate school. This isn't what we did. And, and you're in the, the boat together with all of us right now. As we scramble to think about how to digitize something that we were so accustomed to doing in person. Today, I wanna have a conversation with a person who is a success story in this, and I get to work with him each week. Clay Fowler, minister at Church of Christ at White Station, also a School of Theology student, has put together a series of makeshift studios, and we're gonna talk about kind of that evolution over the past two months. Clay, glad you can be with us today. Thank you, I enjoy it. Yeah, so, Clay, let's just go back seven weeks ago, eight weeks ago, we were in our fellowship hall service together. We knew we couldn't have everybody in there together. We told most people stay home. You put up a camera in the back of the room. That was week one. Yeah. Week um, two, actually, week, yeah. yeah. Yeah, actually I had, uh, you know, everything, like seems like every day the rules were changing and, and what we were gonna do was, out of date six hours later and so it was really fluid and so i think it was thursday afternoon we decided to cancel bible class cancel other meetings move down to one service just for those people who were comfortable for coming and then try to somehow cobble together a live stream for everybody else who wanted to stay home and so by friday morning i'm trying to figure out how to do that and so just on the you know, last minute bare bones, I ended up just parking a webcam in the front row and sitting in the second row and operate it from there. Um, and we've made a lot of adjustments since then, but that, that was pretty much it for the first week. Yeah, it was kind of like the between two ferns look. And I think that was our first week using Vimeo as a church, right? So yeah. we were a little, let's be fair, we're together this way. We, were, we weren't exactly live streaming anything. We might have been a little bit behind where yeah. some who are watching this are. I think, though, we've been at warp speed the last uh, eight weeks. So after that first week, we said, OK, there's no reason to have there's no reason for us to be in our fellowship hall or in our auditorium because there's no people there. So then you moved it across the hall to what we call our fireplace room, which is a small multi-purpose room. Tell about that setup. Yeah, so um, Monday morning after that first service, and it became apparent that we really don't need to meet it in person at all, uh, just for safety's sake. And, you know, the rules had changed again. So uh, it really became a much more responsible conversation after that and trying to figure out, um, well, if, we're, if we don't need to house a lot of people, we don't need to be in a big room. We really just need to facilitate the content um, in a way that, um, makes people feel like they're still a part of White Station at some factor, um, but is also a little more convenient than trying to do all this stuff in a room that's designed for 300 people. So um, tried to cast my mind around the campus for different locations and settled on the fireplace room because it had a, it had a, a neat vibe and a, and, a, and a wall that has a bunch of old hymns on the, in frames. And so um, it also had a, a plenty of space to be able to Kind of set up equipment and whatever else and so uh it was out of the way as, as well and um you know it's kind of a moot point because there's nobody's coming to the building right now so you could kind of be wherever you wanted to and so that was kind of the room that i went to um, that was the easiest to sort of co-opt into the live streaming process and that first week we had a lot of people in the room we, you know we we brought our kind of music program with us so we come in I remember I was coming in to preach that Sunday and we have eight of our praise team members sitting at, with music stands with lights on them. Uh, we had live participants doing different features of our service like announcements or Lord's Supper, those kinds of things. And, and then after that first week, we kind of pivoted away from that. Yeah, but the praise team was was great. I think it worked well. Um, but then we started to realize half of the members on the praise team, or a majority of the members of the praise team were in one of the risk categories in some fashion, either they were uh, seniors, or they were in the medical field, or they're police officers, or, you know, they're out and about, and they, they really need to be more mindful of 
um, you know, what they're exposed to and what they would be exposing each other to. So um, they took the next day or two and uh, came in and, you know, were spread around a big room and recorded a bunch of music so that they didn't have to come in every week. And then it really became down to just whoever's going to be right in front of the camera um, showing up each week for the live stream. So that allowed you to do something with pre-recorded music that allowed you to synchronize the words and the songs so that you made them more like a movie that was streaming each week. Right. So I had audio files that had been recorded by the praise team. So I took those audio files and, and um, basically made them into the audio track on a video. And then the video, the, the, what's on screen in the video is just a series of images that would have been the slides that you would have seen in the fellowship hall. You know what? And so we have this situation. So now, now we're totally socially distant. We're trying to keep as many people out of the room as possible. A lot of people don't feel comfortable coming to participate anyway. So basically for the last few weeks, basically what you have is like an MC, which has been me, maybe one other person. And, and then a lot of pre-recorded bits. Uh, which are maybe if somebody's going to make comments at Lord's Supper, uh, we've been doing pre-recorded interviews like this one with different people in our church with helping, we're in helping professions and things like this. Um, let me just ask you, because I'll give some tips here, because there are some things where I'll send you a video file and it'll just kill you and you'll just be like, oh, come <laughs> on. Um, right. And so, right. and because we know everybody can just raise up their phone in front of their face and get video of themselves. Just go ahead. Right. What are some kind things we can say to people if they are going to send us video bits that help yeah. with that? Well, um, so one of the things that I saw early on was that, yes, we're going to get everything under the sun as a submission to put this on the live stream. And so I, I tried to sit down and think, um, I have a background in graphic design and, and a little bit in photography. And um, so visual communication is sort of one of my strengths. So I, I, I sat down and wrote a little document that said, if you're going to do some live stream, here's some things to think about. Um, think about your foreground, think about your background, think about lighting, think about um, making sure that, you know, whatever's going on in the background is not distracting, but still, you know, fairly visually interesting. You know, it doesn't need to be an NPR tiny desk shoot, but at the same time, it's probably not great to be standing against a, a cinder block wall either. So, um, you know, just send that to, you know, uh, the people who might be in a position of sending videos. And then uh, once once the video started coming in, I I um I have a video producer software that of my choice. I use Adobe Premiere Pro, so I've been running all of the videos through that software package really just to kind of make sure the cropping is right and put some um some graphics at the beginning and end so that there's a lead in and a lead out for when i use it on sunday and then also to make sure that the audio level is consistent can people just t tell a little bit about adobe premiere pro uh just give a ballpark cost and what level how long would it take for a person to figure out how to use this if they had never used it? Kind of what training would you recommend if people yeah. familiar? So the Adobe Premiere Pro is, is it, it's your heavyweight in the industry. It's really the professional um, video producing software. It's part of the creative cloud package and it, it, it's a hefty price tag. I think it comes out to like 1200 a year or something for a subscription, but there's a lot of alternatives out there. Um, a lot of people, especially if you're working in a Mac platform, iMovie would do the same thing. There's some other um, uh, software titles. If you just Google video editing, there's a lot of just, um, there's some free sources. There's some other uh, options. I just happen to have access to the Creative Cloud suite. So that's what I choose to use. What kind of camera were we using those first few weeks? What was the camera setup? <clears throat> the very first week, it was a it was literally a webcam taped to the top of the camera tripod. Um, so the the quality was not good. The picture was bad. The audio was terrible. Um, but you could still see and understand what was going on. Um, what we've used since is it's a it's a consumer level uh, camcorder. I think it's a Panasonic 
I can't remember the model name at the moment, but it basically anything that will have a real lens on it and is designed to shoot video. You could use a DSLR if you have one of those. It, as long as it has an HDMI output, um, you can get that signal into the computer. Now you have to have um, another little piece of hardware to sit in between your camera and your computer because the signal that comes out of the camera is formatted for um, TVs. And so the signal that your computer is gonna be looking for is not the same signal. Even if you have an HDMI port on your computer, that's typically only for video out. So this little capture card it will translate the signal coming out of your camera into something the computer understands. Yeah. And um, that's, that's kind of a critical piece if you're gonna use a real camera, which I totally, uh, that's one of the kind of the big things that will really step up your picture. Uh, one of the other things that I think is important is to um, consider using a standalone microphone. That's um, you know most cameras can record the audio, but it's it's really better if your setup is flexible, where your camera can be in one spot and your microphone can be much closer. And we that's like a Yeti microphone you'd recommend? Yeah, we use a Blue Yeti just because it has some options on it. Um, we've also um, have access to a blue snowball, but it doesn't have any, you know, it doesn't have any knobs to fiddle with on it. But um, there's a lot of different options out there. A lot of people use the Yeti because they're not too expensive, but they have a lot of good options. And so that gets us to week, I don't know, three or four. And one of the great things about our first kind of makeshift studio was that it was just in this right across the hallway from our fellowship hall where we do one of our worship assemblies. That was nice. It was easy to get in and out of. The problem is it was a multi-purpose room and we said, well, going forward, we can't have a studio in a multi-purpose room that needs used for baby showers and all these other activities right. going on. So you went to a lesser used room and built a studio. Now this got interesting. So tell us about that process. So uh, I realized early on, you know, pretty much everything that I was using in the setup was borrowed from somewhere. So the table was borrowed from the youth group's room. Um, the lights that I was using was was borrowed out of the facility's office. Um, the I was using a, a big black wall between what's on camera and what's off camera, and that needed to come down at some point. And you're right, the room was actually, you know, at some point we're gonna be back on campus. And that room is sort of the, the nice room on campus that you have events in and whatnot. So, um, I, at, you know, at some point I got to thinking, you know, we're going to have to move this. But I also had the thought that, you know, it, this needs to be more than just a Band-Aid in a pandemic. Um, if, you, if you think about it, it wasn't that long ago that a lot of churches had an offset printing press somewhere on their campus. You know, I, I don't know. I've lost count of the number of of older preachers who I have met who know how to run an AB Dick 360 or a Hamada 700 or whatever, uh, because you know at one point uh, Churches of Christ were pretty heavy into producing printed material, and so then I got to thinking, well, you know, what's today's equivalent to the printing press of the 60s and 70s, and it's social media and especially video. So if I'm going to spend some time and devote a space on campus to making video it's going to be useful much longer than the, the idea of this pandemic and we'll, just because we can't be on campus. And now when we use words like studio, I know that two thirds of you who are watching this are like, well, I just, now you lost me. This sounds really, <laughs> really expensive. And I want to tell you that what Clay's going to talk about today is not cheap, but it's not terribly, it's not prohibitively expensive. Right. So Clay, talk us through building a studio in one week on a, uh, a coronavirus budget. A coronavirus. So if you, if you kind of think of it modularly, you don't have to do it in one week. Um, so I, I've actually put together our current studio over several weeks, but I've, I've got a piece in place and then we got it enough to where it's on screen on Sunday. And then the next week I can go through and upgrade another piece and then get it through on Sunday. But, but really you want to make sure that you think about four main areas. You want to talk about, uh, you want to, you want to look at what content you want to produce. 
because that's going to drive some of your other decisions. Uh, you want to look at uh, the location. You know, is this a, a room that's actually viable? Uh, you want to look at your setup, which is all the equipment you need to kind of put together to make sure it's done well. And then you want to look at the stream. So, you know, it's one thing to have all the stuff and uh, be able to, to shoot the video. It's another thing to get it out to the world. So um, when you're thinking about content, you know, what kinds of things are you planning on shooting? Um, is it just one person talking or is it going to be flexible enough to have two people to have a conversation there? Are you going to want to be able to bring in um, props and other items? I mean, obviously, uh, you've made great use of that with uh, baking shows and flannel graphs and whatever else. And um, <clears throat> Also, you know, you might want to consider, is it going to be somebody standing there at a lectern with a, with a TV screen behind them? Or is it going to be a, like a projector screen? Or does it just need to be a background? Or you know, all that kind of stuff. So uh, what kind of content you want to do? And some of that will drive the other things. When you start to look around for a location, you want to pick a place that's somewhat familiar to your viewers. You don't want it to feel like you've gone to the other end of the city and you're trying to do stuff that people aren't familiar with. Your viewers will find it distracting if you don't have a sense of location in the, in the picture. So if you're just shooting against a blank wall, um, there's a lot of people that, you know, I, I don't want to call it OCD or ADHD or anything, but there's a lot of people that that's going to present an issue with attention. So you, you kind of want it to be in a sense of location that you have a space around you. Um, your background should be mildly interesting without being overly complicated or distracting. Um, you know, <laughs> we've seen the video on online with the, the guy who's called in to the, you know, the national news outlet and, you know, about halfway through it, his, his toddler walks in the door and then the baby comes in with the crawler and then the mom comes in to, to, to drag them back out, you know, and I think that made the news um, I think I'm actually <laughs> ready to be that guy. I can hear stuff behind <laughs> me right now. I can stare up behind me. But, yeah. Um, yeah. So you want to make sure that, you know, your background is, is good, but you, you just want to also make sure it's a room that has enough space in it. And there's more things to put in this room than you initially think. You think a camera and a person, but you also want to have, you know, your subject in the foreground and your background needs to be in the background. It needs to be a good 10 feet behind whoever's okay. in the foreground. Um, that's just makes it easy for the camera. It makes it easy for the people. Um, the, you also need room for your camera and your microphone and whatever lights you're going to use. And then, um, you know, you have to have a, enough space for people to dance around. You know, you got to have people um, maybe leave scene and come into scene and you got to have a, a spot for those people to wait. And, you know, so you kind of have to think through all that stuff. You're going to have a, a spot for a computer and a person to operate the live stream. So they, they got to hang out somewhere. And if you're not all tripping over each other, it's, it's a whole lot better. Uh, you also want to choose a room that's not too live. So there's some audio stuff going on here. If you uh, do this in a, in a big hall, you're going to end up with a lot of reverb. If you're in a, if you're in a room that has a lot of tile and um, hard walls, then you're going to get a lot of echoey kind of audio. So you, you can do some stuff to, mitigate that but it, it's it's easier just to choose a room that's not too live in the first place well you know and i want to say that about the sound because initially when you use words like studio people hear this and think oh this is going to be so much hardware yeah i walked in uh to what you had done and my first thought was like wow it's really actually very simple there's not a ton of hardware i would actually say and those of you who are watching this, I, I would probably say it's probably true for the context you're in. We're talking about less actual hardware than all of you have in your sound booth at church. And so this is, this is not going to be even like walking in one of those where you have giant mixing boards and large speakers. Part of the digital thing is that you can just go plug your laptop in and have the, the number one piece of equipment you're going to be using. Is that right? Yeah, I, I would say as long as your camera is good and as long as you got some decent lights and a good way to capture audio and whatever computer you're going to use, that, that's pretty much it for the technical side of things. You'll want to set up some things in your room to make sure that, you know, the background and the sound and whatever else are good. But, but yeah, it's not like you're setting up a, a professional recording studio that's going to be miking 14 instruments or anything like that. So. Um, yeah, it, it's really not all that much stuff. You just kind of have to think through where all the pieces are going to sit. Now, you painted the room. 
you painted a wall and you built some sound panels, deafening panels. Talk, talk a little about that. So, yeah, so in an, in, in, a, in an effort to be flexible, thinking that this room is going to be used in a number of ways, um, I set up some, some brackets that will hold a number of different backgrounds that can be rolled up out of the way. And what do you and mean I by backgrounds? The wall. Tell, tell people what you so, mean by backgrounds. Okay, so yeah, um, in photography studios, you'll, you may have gone into a studio and, and had portraits taken or whatever, and you'll notice that there's some rollers in the back wall that the photographer can roll one background up and roll another one down. And they're, they're just basically giant sheets of fabric with a background printed on them. This and, is um, Olin Mills, then, for those of you who are yes. watching. This is like <laughs> yes. the family came you know, in, Mills. dad's wearing a tweed suit, mom has a dress, and then there's a landscape and there's like three deer looking at your family while you were right. standing there in tweed jackets. So yeah. this is Olin Mills. Yeah. Uh, and those options are still out there on Amazon, by the way, if you if you really want to burn one of your background rollers for that. But, um, you know, I basically went on Amazon, found a couple of backgrounds that were, you know, I think they were $35 each or something, got them, got them hung on the wall. But then I decided you can also buy uh, the fabric that's that's green to use as a green screen. But I decided to just paint the wall green instead and not waste one of my background options as a flat green background. So um, painted one wall green and then uh, there were a couple of large windows in that room. So I sort of I blocked those up and, and covered them and painted that wall. But aside from that, I really didn't make a lot of modifications to the room itself. Okay, so talk a little bit more. That's kind of the room. Uh, you talked a little bit about how to think about things like sound quality. What do people need to know? What are some values in their head, some kind of uh, overriding principles we need to think about when we think about building this studio and doing projects? So I, the, the biggest thing is, is don't get caught up in designing the studio. Don't let it overshadow who you are as a congregation. You want to design something that's going to be true to who you are as a congregation. You know, there's a current joke, you know, going around social media about the, during the pandemic of, you know, there's a single parent, and they have all four of their kids ahead in school studies right now, and they're managing to renovate a bathroom, and they've also launched a successful business, and meanwhile, the other person was just having a hard time getting from the bedroom to the desk to make it to a Zoom meeting, you know. Um, there's some truth to that on the congregational level as well, so, you know, don't be intimidated by what you see in other churches' live streams. Just do what you can and uh, don't worry about it. Yes, put some thought into it. Yes, put your best foot forward, so to speak, but don't let it pull you away from your identity as a community of believers. Every congregation has an essence or a personality, and the, really the whole point is to have as much of that come through your stream as possible. I've, I've thought about that with, with what you and I have done together, where it, this has given us an opportunity, like there's no kind of model out there, there's no prescription on how to build these live stream assemblies. And, and I would say we've taken the approach where we decided don't just take what you do in a Sunday worship service and stick it on screen. We've tried to think about some warm elements of including some things that aren't that, I don't think that what we do is for everybody. I also don't think what everybody else does is for us. I think you're right. You got to figure out what speaks. But, but, I, but I would say what speaks through a camera is different than what speaks through your eyes in a, in a live assembly with a lot of people. And so. Right, right. You have to kind of envision how people are going to interact with what you're producing. So rather than sitting a pew with uh, all of their spiritual family sitting with them, they're, they're probably going to be sitting at home um, looking at you on a, on a larger screen. So the way that feels, uh, you don't need to try to recreate a large space in your stream because it will look funny inside of the small space of their living room. So, so I think that the, you mentioned the example that, and I'm sure all of you watching this will think of things that you could do, but like we used a flannel graph and yeah. you know, that's uh, 50 years or more old kind of habit that most churches have thrown away. Yeah. And in live church, even though most of us wouldn't use flannel graph, in live church, it's almost a disastrous thing anyway. It's only a novelty because people can't see it. Right. 
but on a camera, it shows really well. It gives people something to do with their eyes. And there's a visual that's kind of fun. And there is a, there is a nostalgic element. But, but the visual of it was better than if you do it in a, a service. We've done a, we did a preparing your own communion bread demonstration. Same thing. Right. You can see a bowl and a spatula much better on screen than you can see it in a live assembly. So whatever you all watching this can think of, things that translate better to a camera uh, is something to think about in the context of watching things on screen. Right. And that kind of circles back around to when you design this space, you want it to be flexible enough to be able to do those sorts of things. And um, just kind of just be creative and your imagination is the limit. Um, obviously, you want to pay attention to uh, your biblical truths and and it's not just a, a wild tv show that we're producing that we can do everything but you know within reason and within um what we think is appropriate I, you know you can you can do a lot of other stuff that you wouldn't typically consider in your in your usual sunday morning clay i think they want to see pictures of our studio can we show them what we've done let's try Okay, so now you're looking at, this is week one we're looking at here, right, Clay? Yeah, so this was the 36 hours notice, get a live stream going. I pulled one of the chairs out of the front row and parked a tripod there, used some masking tape to put a webcam, and I put it on the tripod because it was easy to, in case I needed to pan around or pan up to view, there's a screen just out of shot that's up high, you can't see. And then, and then I sat here a Sunday morning and, and ran the live stream from the front row. So uh, after this, we decided I don't want to do that anymore. So <laughs> um, it wasn't the best quality. It was, it was, you know, what we could do in the moment. So the, the next setup, um, this is in the fireplace room. So this room uh, is in two halves. You have the half that's in front of the camera and then the half that was um, behind the camera. So we, we referenced, this is where the praise team would sit and I'm projecting the slide that has the lyrics and everything on the wall there. Uh, but let me go back to the, the other side. So you can see it really is just kind of the room with a camera and a microphone and a stool and some lights. And these are the, you know, the Home Depot brand shop lights that, you know, everybody has. And that's what I could throw in the moment. and to figure out something better. Um, this is from the other end of that table. This is where I would uh, sit and there's your flannel graph. Yeah. Um, so this is, th I took this during the service and so that, that's what it looked like in the moment. This is a, a wide Scott, a shot of the new studio and so it, it kind of looks like it's got a lot of pieces, but you can sort of tell it really is just a classroom upstairs in our in our other building. Um, I, again, I've got a you know a camera sitting there. I hung the mic from the ceiling just to get it out of the way. I've got some lights that are on the backdrop hanging there, and then I have some other lights that I built hanging from the ceiling. So everything is kind of up and out of the way. I built some boxes for some sound treatments on the wall, but they're pretty simple. And um, then you yeah, when you say backdrop. boxes, you actually just built wooden boxes with a uh -huh. so what what is hanging over them or well, I've I've got another picture. We'll get we'll get to okay. that in a second. Okay, and uh, this is sort of from the camera's point of view, so you can see our our little camcorder there with the with the line coming out to the computer, and then the mic and the this gives a better shot of sort of the backdrop system. It's got you know, chains that you pull on to roll and unroll the backdrops. And then I painted the wall green and that that's pretty, pretty simple when it comes to setup. This is from the front corner of the room looking back towards where I sit. So you can see the lights for the foreground as well as the lights that are on the background. I built these little hoods just so that light didn't escape and, you know, light up the side of whoever's on camera. Um, but the room looks much emptier than the other room did because I hung it from the ceiling. So <laughs> that gets it out of the way, lets you get other stuff in there in case you need it. Uh, this is the view that you typically see. And so um, I like to have the camera a little farther back than zoomed in. That way it's less intimidating. It's not so much in your face. And it's the person who's there is a little more relaxed. There's enough going on as it is um, than to try to figure out how to how to you know overcome that 
you can see the mic and then the lights that I made and some more acoustical treatment in the back. Here's, here's a detail on the box that I built. So basically this is um, rock wool insulation like that's in your walls at home. And um, this is the size it comes. And so I built a box that was that size. So I didn't have to cut the insulation or anything that gets a little messy. And so it's basically some one by four screwed together and then some cloth stapled over the front of it, hung it on the wall and then it's done. Um, what that does for you is it cuts down on the reverb in the room. It absorbs sound really well and um, it helps your recordings sound more present. Here's a detail on the lights that I built for the foreground. These are LED strips that um, you can get on Amazon or other places. I think it, they come on like a 15 foot roll and they're, they're like $20 or something. Um, if you can tell, I've got three different color temperatures of white. These are all technically white. One's a warm white, and one's a cool white, and one's a neutral white. And I set it up so that they're all on dimmers and you can adjust how strong each one is based on how it appears on camera. But, you know, mostly we just run them full strength the whole way. Putting them in a big box like this, instead of having one single point of light, really reduces shadows and makes it a softer light, uh, much better quality picture rather than having the you know, hard shadows from your nose or whatever uh, in, in the camera. And then here's the, uh, here's the, here's the studio in action. Uh, Bob's other wonderful assistant and they're showing how they make the uh, communion bread. So as you can see, um, <clears throat> Bob has a nice little cart over here with all the stuff that he can just set down off camera. But if you can see the little preview on the screen down here, it's not showing anywhere. And so it's easy because we have all this space to have stuff at hand that doesn't have to be on camera. So as you sit down and think about your studio, that, that's another consideration. And, and the height of the participants, you can see she's standing on a, a stool that we have. And yeah. we can, you'll think about that, whether or not you want people standing or sitting or maybe helped out with height. Yeah. So that's, that's the slideshow. You know, I, it, it's interesting too. This is seven or eight week process. We've all learned a lot. You've taught us a lot. I'm yeah. just curious what, um, kind of from a ministry perspective, how, what, how has this shaped you? How has this made you think about ministry? Because I, I do think there was a little bit more innovation in the last eight weeks that we maybe usually have and kind of, what are your reflections on that? Um, I, I think a lot of people um, have approached this time, I don't know if it goes so far as to say in, in, in a spirit of fear, but it, at least in a very reactionary sense. And I, I really feel like in, in the last few weeks, we've, taken the, we've been able to, to take the initiative to, to, to be proactive in, in how can we really communicate gospel truths in ways that this new medium will help. Because um, really, that boy, that's what it boils down to is is the message. Are are we talk, are we speaking Christ? And this new medium opens some ev avenues that um, that a traditional auditorium setting wouldn't. So I, it's really kind of refreshing to think about the different ways that you can tell the same old story and um, be able to to do it in in be able to kind of flex some of your creativity and and some of your imagination and be able to sort of reframe things a little bit, get just a little more personal with people and, and build community, even though you're not in the same room. That's right. Yeah, I think it's been a refreshing time to kind of think about those things too. And um, now, of course, you're a student at the School of Theology and Zoom has kind of you know, been a way of life uh, for us. And that's something we all think about is, okay, so what's, you know, what's the next step in the delivery and how do we, how do we try to stay out in front of these things because i do think churches uh this will be i don't i don't think we're going back this will be a, a place where we think about this permanently uh how to use yeah. zoom how to use video yeah and that was really one of the realizations that, that that led me to to dedicate this this new room to to having a space to be able to do this in you know i don't have to worry about breaking any of this down or getting it out of the way for a another event or whatever, it, it's just a room that's dedicated to this and it's it, it set up all the time. You know, any, any of the members of the ministers can, can um, 
request to use it and, and be able to record what they need to record. It, it'll do live stream. It, the software that the OBS software will do live stream, it'll also record just as well. So it doesn't have to be for a live event. You can record other sorts of materials in as well. Okay, for all of you watching this, we're gonna have below this video some recommended resources. We're gonna tell the type of uh, software he used and there'll be a little kit of uh, recommended equipment. But remember, as, as we said, figure out what you need, figure out what best works for you, figure out for your context what's gonna speak. That's really the key. But I do think if you take anything away today, it's that you uh, can do some affordable studio setup that meets uh, the needs of your church and your mission. Clay, you're a great student. You're a great minister. Thank you for sitting down and sharing some of your expertise with us today. You're very welcome. Thank you, Bob. All right. Take care. All right.